This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Roja Shy. Hello, so Roja Shy begin with another episode of Musings of the Shy podcast as we continue our discussion of the Bitcoin block size debate. On this section of the debate, we are doing all the downsides of the, the downside, if you will, of the uh, various proposals that have been put forth when it comes to this block size debate. In this case, we're talking about uh, user activated software and SegWit. Uh, this is episode 149, the equal twin problems, uh, user activated software, SegWit, uh, and 141, so SegWit 2x, 141, uh, why Bit 41 didn't get activated, what is the downsides of either activations of user activated software or SegWit 2x to, um, to Bitcoin in general. And then this is also um, part three, all the downsides, part three of as we examine the negatives of these different proposals, if you will. But before we get into that, before we get into that discussion, the news. So the Bank of Thailand relaxes strict rules and studies Bitcoin. This is something a lot of companies are doing now. This is by Kevin Helms of Bitcoin News. Bank of Thailand ordered to relax strict rules and study Bitcoin. The Bank of Thailand has been ordered by the Thailand Deputy Prime Minister to Look closer at Bitcoin and relax the strict rules, but which would benefit any Bitcoin. Uh, the Thai Deputy Prime Minister, Sue McKind, uh, just posted the order the Bank of Thailand, the BOT, to study if, well, that's an unfortunate acronym, uh, to study if Bitcoin is more of a bad spot than it is. So it's an interesting thing I want to talk about. It's an earlier way to talk about it earlier. So you recorded me, me, have access to it. Bitcoin is so both place and he's in custody and hasn't been extradited, or at least there's not been any news of his extradition to the U.S. But anyways, that's just a side note. Uh, the bot already knows what rules and regulations should be amended. The deputy minister said not everything is prohibited. Whatever is too much is not good. Whatever is too little is also not good, he argued. While many in Thailand cannot compete with financial centers such as Singapore, he hopes will be a fintech leader among the neighbors, including Cambodia, Laos, Minar, and Vietnam. I mean, the article continues. Um, it's interesting that many of the Asian countries, particularly in the Southeastern Asian region, are jumping on board and looking and examining uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as a, a mechanism for their economic growth and wealth. And I'm wondering if it has to do anything to do with China's presence and that China's active presence to be the dominant force within um, the sphere of Asia, with the fact that they are not only a significant economic power on its own, but that, that they are in this space as well. And maybe this is a hedge on the part of these various governments to counter the economic influence that China has and make sure that they don't have any type of leg up against them, if you will, or any type of, um, I don't know, leap ahead, if you will, to try to get ahead of China, I guess you would say. <clears throat> so that's it for the news. Let's get straight into it as we discuss the downsides of SegWit in of itself as it, on its own, about the user activated soft fork as well as Sega 2X. So in the course of editing these episodes for all the downsides of these proposals, uh, BIP91 locked in. So we had recorded this episode initially like either July 17th or 18th as it was going on. But now here um, on a Friday on the 22nd, Bit 91 has locked in, and here's what that means and what it does not. So this is Bitcoin Magazine by Aaron Van Weirdum. It looks as if Bitcoin is getting segregated with this. Uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 91 has just locked in. Up to 90% of all hashing power signals supported for this soft fork, which implies miners intend, intended to turn to trigger segregated witness activation by the system should make Bit 148 obsolete in August 1st and non event. But SegWit is not certain. In fact, on a technical level, SegWit is not any closer to activation at all. And it kind of just reiterates what um, we talked about about Bit91. So, if all goes well, what could go wrong? Although well over 80% of the hashing power has signaled for Bit4 for Bit91 lock-in, that doesn't actually guarantee anything. Most importantly, it doesn't even in itself mean that the miners are, will still signal Bit1 from SegWit. Indeed, so far, most miners don't. And currently, the proposition of miners signaling Bit1 is so far lower than the Bit91 activation, which is just. It's even lower than 50%. 
Moreover, Bit 91 will probably be enforced by hardly any economical relevant nodes, that is, nodes operated by users that accept Bitcoin as payment. Almost no Bitcoin user on the network recognizes Bit 91 as its Bit before signaling at all, and will therefore continue to accept blocks with, with or without Bit 1. Bit 91 will instead be enforced by hash power alone. This in turn means that a majority of miners by hash power can back out of BIP-91 with little more than a reputational damage. They will continue to mine blocks that do not single BIP-1 even after BIP-91 activates in a few days. And as long as these miners are the majority, they will still control the longest valid chain and valid, valid according to most miners and valid to most users. Furthermore, any minority of miners in the few nodes that do enforce the BIP-91 software will then be forked off the Bitcoin network. In a few days from now, then these miners would mine on top of the blocks that almost only they themselves would care for, while most of the rest of the entire Bitcoin network completely ignore them. But this week's day, of course, signaling the majority of miners have effectively made a statement that would tend to start to activate SegWit software within a couple of days. But for now, that's all it is, a very public blockchain-based statement of intent. An actual SegWit activation should start next week if miners stick to the stated intent. So there is no certainty even then that SegWit is getting act activated, and because Bit91 is signaled, I think it blocks any kind of other signaling for a software because you can only have one software going at a time until BIP91, I guess, expires a year from now. So they can play this signaling game forever, really. Silly. I'm going to have to look further into that. I was already looking further into it, but for the Bitcoin ABC and things of that nature, those episodes, um, because again, this is the Bitcoin community and all sorts of silliness is always bound to happen. At any given moment. So this is just an add-on that I had to do because of editing purposes to indicate that BIP91 was activated by the miners. So let's talk about the downsides of SegWit in general, just the concept of SegWit, of uh, uh, rearranging those signatures, if you will. Um, a number of people in general have just had a, an issue with that, with that reorganization of the block, if you will, by removing those signatures. And one of the things that they have issue with is the concept of anyone can spin. So, and the question is brought up quite a bit. So, according, so this comes from RPTC, SegWit and anyone can spin question. According to Bitcoin Core, all SegWit transactions will be broadcast to sign as everyone can spin transactions in the normal blockchain while having this extra set of data that gives detail on how it can be spent. My questions are, if for some reason SegWit is abandoned, literally all the money in those addresses can be stolen by anyone? Question, is it not a dangerous situation to sign a transaction with an anyone can spend script? Question, uh, is it, it feels to me that this is a nightmare scenario like the DAO where the extra complexity creates an unintended consequences compared to the transactional signature. If SegWit passes, my understanding is I can still continue to use normal addresses starting with one, and not be affected by the above concern question. So, someone did answer this. Um, yes, it, the same is true for P2SH multi address 3. If P2SH is banned, you can steal all the money in those accounts. However, it is very unlikely to happen. The same is true with SegWit if it reaches the 95% minor consensus, and a lot of people start to rely on it. So, here's a more detailed thing. SegWit so requires that any can spend scripts in order that you can track an extra data on the witness block without introducing scripts that all nodes can't validate so the SegWit can be soft fork. This would be this all can be avoided by a proper hard fork. In fact, SegWit as a soft fork is not necessary as none of the features it contains require segregated witnesses. Extra block data or anyone can spend transactions if they're implemented by hard fork. Core by introducing SegWit as a software ensures that this ugly or unnecessary hack will exist forever. You can't discard the hack in the future because then all the SegWit transactions would become actually anyone can spend transactions. So even if Bitcoin and Limit would be to fork off, they would have to implement SegWit in order to avoid creating massive losses even though it's a software. That's how Core ensures that even its opponents will have to do its bidding in the future. And the only way you can escape that is by forking off before the first SegWit transaction is landed in the blockchain. This is the reason why consensus changes should never ever be a soft fork. The part of the network that does not agree with the new consensus should safely fork off so that all interests are preserved correctly in the respective blockchains. So this is one of the, the contentions here is that if someone were to fork off later into existence and didn't like SegWit, they couldn't do so because you have this anyone can spin and so within that block chain history, you can start going back and messing with people's 
Bitcoin, if you will. Now, there is a rejection of this, or a counterpoint that this is not actually actually true that uh, anyone can spend, so stop saying they can. This is by uh, John Hardy. This came out February of this year. Anyone who argues against SegWeb because it uses anyone can spend transaction either is being disingenuous and doesn't understand what they're talking about. Anyone can spend is just where to describe a transaction which no one had, which has no condition attached to it, to how its outputs can be spent. This has been part of the Bitcoin protocol since forever. To prevent all nodes from being excluded from the network, as in the case of the hard fork, SegWeb uses a clever trick that enables all nodes to see SegWeb transactions by making them appear as anyone can spend. The fear is misinformation, especially that the new transaction created by Segwit will be insecure because it says anyone can spin. Duh. Problem is, it's just plain false. Segwit is a, is a software which means miners introduce new rules. The new rules means that although Segwit transactions specifically appear to own notes as anyone can spin, the rules dictate these transactions can't be spent without a valid signature. The worst case scenario is that miners can mine a block that breaks these rules and own notes will still recognize it as valid. It's foolish to consider this is a genuine risk. The miners will be wasting all their resources mining an invalid block and for, and for what? To make a few remaining own nodes think that some segment transaction had a different owner? What would that accomplish? The answer is nothing at all. The block would be offered almost immediately, and nobody would be affected except the miner. Anyone who persists in making this argument is lying or dead, and by exposing themselves to the IRV saints completely undermines their cause, it can be safely dismissed. But he does bring up the point that some people bring up again about SegWit is that miners could try to attack or trick the network, if you will, by um, mining a non-SegWit block or changing the, the block in itself to convince these old nodes to consider it valid. And so much resources just with like the 51% um, attack on a, on a blockchain will be needed to do that. So that's not necessary a uh, I would say a valid argument but it's one that has been um, put out there when it comes to SegWit. Now says Litecoin has activated uh, SegWit. They have what is called a million dollar bounty in Litecoin to break SegWit from anonymous Redditor. So if you're capable of breaking SegWit you're going to retain this bounty. So one million dollar bounty in Litecoin to break SegWit from anonymous Redditor. Uh, this is from Bfango from Steemit in the Litecoin section. It looks like people have gone out of the way to talk smack about SegWit and how it's going to be the death of Litecoin due to the ability for others to possibly spin your coin. Well, there's no certainty in this aspect, but it looks like Redditor throwaway four zero three 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 eight two one zero seven one six. It is able to throw up his own coin, and the bounty answers very question. And we're about to see a new gold rush of people looking to break a coin on a bounty that, if broken, could change the history of Litecoin forever and, and kill the bounty. Looks like we are seeing a new meta when it comes to understanding of how digital currency works and how it's thought to be broken. I believe it's going to be the best way to determine that SegWit is very cool, like some of the more pious Bitcoiners talk about. Litecoin is always doing interesting things with puzzles, like a recent bounty for a 7K from Charlie Lee and Company. A lot of people have been saying that SegWit is unsafe because SegWit coins are any can be stolen. So let's put this to test. I put up 1 million of LTC into a SegWit address. You can see a SegWit address because it, I spent I set it to spent 1 LTC first to reveal the redeem script. Well, so let's see if SegWit is really anyone can spend or not. Good luck. And so there's a link in the, the show notes of this and it hasn't happened yet. It has not happened. So that's it's been two months. So if someone could have broken segment, it would have happened. This would have been, if it would have occurred. There's a million dollars that people could seek or take. You know, one of the primary reasons was an active in So this basic beach thing was this um, software and hardware information that Bitmain, the, the mining company, as well as an exchange company, they're all over the place when it comes to the Bitcoin space, had developed that would uh, allow for their, their miners to be more efficient. They never disclosed it. It was like a secret sauce type of a deal. And it gave them a 30% energy efficiency boost, allowed them to be able to mine better, uh, mine at a, a better rate, or, 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 and more efficient and uh, less economic burden from the, from their machines. 
And one of the primary reasons that many people believe that Bitcoin 41, which was integrated into the Bitcoin Core uh, system, was that Bitmain and whatever miners that may have been um, included into this uh, ASIC Boost software deal uh, didn't want it because then they wouldn't have this, this secret sauce working for them. They would have to either develop a entirely different new secret sauce or because of the way the SegWit configured that it wouldn't be possible for them to have this efficiency. And so that was why one of the reasons why SegWit was not not only developed but also delayed. And then there's this where um, Blockstream, uh, what the company that's affiliated with MIT and with the Bitcoin developers, many of the Bitcoin developers, work for Blockstream. Um, and it's a funny mechanism, many consider it to be a funny mechanism to pay the developers to work on the Bitcoin core development. Now, not all Bitcoin developers uh, work for Blockstream, but many of them do, some of the key ones do. And here's one of the contentions that pe many people have in general against SegWit. Uh, besides, besides the mechanics of changing the shifting of the, the block size and uh, things of that nature, or miners, you know, uh, losing their shaker sauce special here. Uh, Blockstream having pa patents in SegWit makes all the weird pieces of the last three years fall perfectly into place. This put was posted on RBTC by a German Bitcoiner. Uh, Important to post this with block immediately on our Bitcoin, but not on RBTC. Based on Blockstream's behavior in the Bitcoin community, I've become absolutely certain that SegWit contains patents that Blockstream and or slash the owners are planned to use offensively. I base this not on having read the actual patents, where they can be kept secret for quite some time. I base this on observing Blockstream's behavior and having seen the exact same behavior many times before in the past 20 years from entities that all went bankrupt. In the previous part of my career, I was making telecom standards. I meant that met meeting with a lot of representatives from other companies somewhere around the globe once a month and negotiating what would go on the standard that we will all later follow. I was represented at Microsoft and I would meet with people from Nokia, Ericsson, AT&T, and many other corporate names we recognize instantly in small groups to negotiate standards going forward. One thing that was clear in those negotiations was, negotiation was that everyone was trying to get as much as possible of their own patent portfolio into the industry standard. While still, still trying to maintain a facade of arguing purely on technical merits. Some were good at it, some were not very good at it. One of the biggest sure telltale signs of the latter was that somebody would argue that Future X should be used mechanism Y, where they had undisclosed patent um, encumbrance. Based on technical arguments that make no sense. When you, when you use technical experts in the room pointing out how the argument made no sense, they repeat the Future X issue. Should, uh, should absolutely use mechanism Y. But now these are including new rationale, which didn't make any sense either. The real reason they were pushing so hard for Mechanism Y, of course, was that they had patents covering Mechanism Y and wanted a patent technology to go into the industry standard. But they were unable to make a coherent argument that withstood technical scrutiny for why it was a powerful solution at hand, with or without such an encumbrance. In other words, a classic go post movie. As the technical team made up for many people from different um, places, so some people think that this is the case. There hasn't been any proof. There hasn't been any patent um, filings disclosed or anything like that. Um, this comes from Falcon Vin Net. It was also reposted on, uh, as I read, from Reddit. But again, who wrote it? Uh, by Rich Falcon. But again, this is... This is one of the reasons why many people were against SegWit, is that they believe that Blockstream has these patents. So I'm going to continue from the actual, directly from the article itself. Okay, so I'm dropping down here. So there's a way that behavior makes sense. It makes utter and complete sense in the way, and I want to emphasize again, that I have not read any of Blockchain patent applications, and would be pointless to do so, as they can keep secret for something like 18 months. So I would, wouldn't have access to the full set anyway. But based on Blockstream's behavior, I can say with dead certainty that I can see in his exact behavior many times in the past and it's always when somebody has a dual set of reasons, one for presentation and palette and another that drives the actual course of action. With that said, Blockchain is something called a defensive patent pledge. It's a piece of legal text that basically says that they will only use their patents for a defensive action or any other action. Did you get that last point? That's a construction, construction which is very similar to terrorism and other crimes where that and other crimes creates a subset of terrorism and therefore even makes the first part completely superfluous. The 
politics is terrorism and other crimes. The public cares terrorism. What it really means is any crime, including jay- jaywalking. The Blockstream patent pledge is exactly this pattern. Blockstream only uses patents defensively or other way that Blockstream sees fit. Blockstream defense. For defense only or other reasons. The public cares for defense only. What it really means is for any other reasons. Let's assume in good faith here for a moment that Greg Maxwell and Adam Back are block- a Blockstream. But they don't have any intentions to use patents defensively, and, they just, and they're just underwriting the patent pledge with all their personal credibility. It's still not worth anything. In the event the blockchain goes bankrupt, all assets, including these patents, will go to a liquidator, whose job is to make the most money out of their assets on the table, and they're not bound by any promise that the pre bankruptcy manager gave. Moreover, the owners of blockchain may, and I will predict, replace the management in which the case of personal promises from the individuals that have been replaced have no weight whatsoever on the new management. If a company makes a statement to its intentions, it's also free to make the opposite statement as a future date, and likely to do so when other people are speaking of the company. This leads us to ask who the owners of Blockstream are. Who would have something to gain from pulling the owner card and placing such a management? Ah. The owners of Blockstream are the classical financial institutions, basically AX, that have everything to lose for cryptocurrency and gain. And they have bought it, invested in the company, which has an opportunity to get patents into the Bitcoin blockchain, and thereby, thereby being able to either outright ban people from using it or collect a heavy rent from anyone and everyone else to use it. So there is this contention or belief that about blockchain and just in general many people do not like the fact that blockchain is a company that employs bitcoin developers um, primarily within the bitcoin core set and may have a say or have a significant influence over the overall development of bitcoin core that might not be in the best interest of the bitcoin community and it's been this way since blockchain was actually really announced really and just in general um like the management of the GitHub and who's in, who has the keys and who's in charge of things of that nature have been always been a bit of a cont- contentious for some people and a bit of a stickler, if you will, um, when it comes to that. Now, whether or not this is bunk or actually true or not, this is one of the, the things is... So, Segwit 2X, why are people having issues with it? It still has the same dilemmas that people have with the overall in general mistrust of SegWit with either the misunderstanding of anyone can spend it, the possibility of patents on the part of Blockstream, uh, the fact that it's moving the block size and reconfiguring it um, doesn't really, for many people, address the fundamental issues of the transaction fees. Uh, while it does allow for other scaling methods, there are those who still, you know, they want things to occur on-chain. They don't necessarily want everything pushed off chain. They still want to do, you know, buy their coffee, do their transactions, hold things. Again, it's about the whole viewpoint that we spoke and talked about in the way of Satoshi. Is Bitcoin um, a settlement layer, you know, bear bond, or is it actually digital cash? So let's get into the suits, uh, Segway 2X. First off, again, just like Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, and Bitcoin XT, uh, is a proposal not coming from the Bitcoin core developers. It's um, outside interest, if you will. It is um, the New York Agreement, as we already discussed. So it's people that other than the core developers coming up with this proposal. And some people are very much against that. They like things coming from the core developers. They see it's more open, more transparent. And the case with Sacred 2X is very much the case. Um, they are not allowing the uh, same level of scrutiny as... Uh, Bitcoin Core does. You can't see everything. You don't know what everything is going on. Not everyone's invited to contribute or to participate. At the same time, not everyone can go on to the test net. So there has been some issues. Uh, there's very buggy. The fact that they're doing this in a very short window of time to try to beat the user-activated software from um, coming into fruition uh, is a bit of concern. So, so many people are rejecting Segment 2X. And also, finally, there is the whole aspect when it comes to the 2X, whether or not the 2X part is going to happen. Even though it's being built in the code with the recent release or beta release, that 90 days after Segway gets activated, that there's supposed to be a 2 megabyte limit supposed to happen. It's supposed to be raised to the limit, which is going to be a hard fork, which could, in essence, cause a chain split if the activation of Segwit 2X itself doesn't cause a chain split. But, 
there is no guarantee even then that that might even actually happen. So there's that concern for people. Um, and also there's just a significant mistrust of minors in general. So I'm reading this article, a little bit from this article by Bitcoin Segway 2 x Scaling Proposal, Core Developer Strike Critical Stance. This came out June 1st from Coindesk. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read about the four fears. So yet, while the implied direct version, the developer debate could be viewed as an example of collaboration and peer review. It's probably worth noting that none of the volunteer developers behind Bitcoin Core signed the agreement on the proposal. First announced by investment portfolio company um, Digital Currency Group last week. As hinted in their concerns above, this is partly because of the technical concerns and partly because some don't believe that a hard work is necessary right now. Capacity increase beyond Segway, some argue, can be brought about in other backwards compatibility ways that don't risk kicking some network participants out of the system. Once the proposal was released, and even long before then, developers have given technical feedback about how best to deploy a hard fork, which might explain a hint of bitterness from developers in recent discussion. But even if many of them aren't keen on details of the proposal, so far that hasn't stopped developers from trying to improve the implementation. I wrote Bit 191 to try to make the proposal more sane to Bitcoin. Bitcoin developer James Hillard added that in his eyes, the current hard fork timeline is completely unrealistic. Others put more weight behind the proposal, which was back, backing from more than 60 companies and more than 80% of the Bitcoin mining pool operators and firms. I think we should look to build from the proposal and improve it, Blockstream CEO Adam Back said. Overall, back as emerges perhaps the one of the more positive voices, with comments suggesting pushback from developers could create perception issues. In particular, he's trying to steer interest in towards a proposal called SpoonNet, a branch of the hard-working research from Bitcoin Core contributor Jonathan Liu. Uh, we'll talk about SpoonNet when we talk about uh, the Bitcoin ABC and the BIP91. Bitcoin Core contributor Eric Labazo, who worked on SegWit Code, had a similar collaborative take. I will work hard with the GC. DCG founder and CEO Barry Silver to make this a success, he wrote on social media, though, though not without some caveats. Of course, Jamie Song has some things to say about the user activated soft fork and said with 2x scenarios and timelines. Uh, he published this uh, July 18th. This is on Medium. So, user activated soft fork slash said with 2x scenarios and timelines. So a bunch of miners started signaling for BIP91 yesterday, and a lot of people are feeling more hopeful about the state of Bitcoin. As said, it looks to lock in and activate in this post. I'm going to update you on the latest developments and what could happen and when. So BIP91 signaling. In case you're not familiar, BIP91 is a mechanism by which SegWit BIP141 can be activated using only 80% of the network agreement instead of the 95% required by BIP141. Essentially, BIP91 requires blocks to signal for BIP141 once 80% of the of a 30, 336 block epoch signals at BIP4. After BIP91 activation, if the blocks don't signal for BIP141, those blocks are orphaned in exactly the same fashion as BIP148, the user, active, user activated software is supposed to do. This is a way to front run BIP148 and remove the possibility of a fork. Now, segwit 2 x the most popular client, that incorporates BIT91 was, was supposed to be released on July 21st, but it looks like several miners started signaling for BIT91 a little early. And with 2x apparently code complete, so this is not a surprise. So, it might be some people are jumping the gun, or they're just trying to get ahead of, because of time crunch, uh, ahead of user-activated software. So I'm going to kind of skip a little bit down here. So BIT91 lock-in. If BIT91 has a special mechanism for a lock and that's different from the other BIP9 based software, BIP141. It requires 95% over 2016 blocks, whereas BIP91 requires 80% over 336 blocks. So a shorter, wins, uh, shorter time span and a lesser amount of consensus. So optimistic timeline. The current BIP91 ECOP started at July 16th at 2017 and ends July 19th. Um, at 2 GM time. As too many blocks failed to single for BIP91 already in this epoch, BIP91 lock in will not happen by block 4776448. Those are all just kind of going over the signaling. So, to summarize the scenario, it looks like this. Um, 
BIP 91 ECOC begins July 19th. By July 21st, BIP 90 closes with 80% signaling, and BIP 91 locks in. Uh, July 23rd, BIP 91 ECOC finished, and BIP 91 is activated. July 27th, or they're about new difficulty adjustment period begins. Every block will be signaling for segment. Um, August 1st, BIP 148 starts but does nothing since every block is signaling BIP 141 due to BIP 91. August 10th, if thereabouts, a difficulty adjustment period closes with 95% signaling and BIP 141 locks in. August 23rd, if thereabouts, difficulty adjustment period closes and BIP 141 segment is activated. November 18th, if thereabouts, the 2x hard fork is scheduled. Uh, delay timeline. Should BIP 91 signaling not reach the 80% threshold in particular ECOP, but get there, get there before July 28th or so, we can see a similar scenario playing out. In this scenario, some New York uh, agreement miners somehow are delayed in signaling of BIP 91. It looks something like this. And July 17th, 19th, ECOP begins. Uh, BIP 91 closes. BIP 91 closes with 80% signaling. Uh, July 23rd closes with 80% signaling. July 26th closes with 80% signaling and BIP 91 locks in. July 20th, BIP 91 ECOT closes. BIP 91 is activated. July 28th, every block signals BIP 141 segment. July 27th, if thereabouts, new difficulty adjustment period begins. Every block from 728 will be signaling for segment, which is likely to be enough 95%. August 1st, BIP 141. 148 starts, but does nothing since every block is signaling BIP 141 due to BIP 91. August 10th, if thereabouts, difficulty adjustment period closes with signals and BIP 141 locks in. August 23rd, if thereabouts, difficulty adjustment period closes and BIP 141 segment is activated. In November 18th, there are two, hard, two X hard work scheduled. Notice that here that even with the delayed timeline, segment activation won't actually be delayed as a new difficulty adjustment period will begin around July 27th. Now this is where it gets interesting if BIP 91 uh, somehow fails. If should BIP 91 signaling somehow not reach 80% before July 28th or so, we'll most likely see a split. So the split, so pretty much the same all the way up to July 29th, ECOP the BIP 91 closes at 80% signaling. And then August 1st, BIP 148 starts. This likely results in two chains on the network where, where with a minority hash rate or with a majority hash rate in a hard fork by miners. At this point, a whole host of things could happen, including Bitmain running Bit, Bit, Bitcoin ABC in response to the user-activated soft fork, a proof of work change, and a lot of other things I will cover in another article. What will be interesting is that the EOP closing around July 29th at 6 o'clock GMT closes with 80% signaling. With 148 Activate at advocate advocates may decide that waiting a day to start their fork may prevent a split and may delay for that reason. Such a scenario is possible, though somewhat unlikely. The possibilities of each scenario. The two scenarios where there's no split and where segment activates seems most likely than the failed BIP 91 scenario. The failed BIP 91 scenario can only really come about if a miner who signaled the New York agreement decides to betray it. This is obviously possible, but would probably um, in injure all manners of mistrust, especially among the Inway and um, the New York signers. More more low probability scenarios like signaling BIP 91 and the not signaling BIP 141 by a majority of miners is possible, but very unlikely and thus aren't covered here. Conclusion. It looks as if BIP 91 will lock in if the New York agreement holds. An, an EPOC with an 80% signaling should happen the next week or so and then the mandatory BIP 141 signaling soft fork rule will be on the network a couple days later. This would mean that BIP 148 will be the front runner and won't, and won't result in a network split. Should BIP 91 fail to reach 80% in the next couple of weeks, this results in a hot war at Bitcoin. This does seem like a low probability scenario and likely won't come to pass. That said, BIP 91 and SegWit activation probably only delays the fight, not avoids it. SegWit 2x hard fork to 2x will be the next big deadline, which will be around November. So it's all of a matter of if this is going to actually act, activate, and the downside is, once again, the split uh, the split in the network should a fork occur. And it has to do with the fact that the miners don't want, I guess, the users to be responsible for activating the segwit with a user activated set fork. And then you have, I personally think, a malicious method, but Bitcoin ABC would it come into effect if the user activated soft fork were to occur. 
So, so to kind of sum up what the um, Segwit 2X is, there are people out there that don't think the, the 2X part is going to happen. The other part is the downside is not actually coming from the Bitcoin core. It's coming outside the Bitcoin core itself. Third is will the agreement hold and will we get a um, activation of SegWit by this means, by their means, which is BIP91. And fourth, the coding, the, the added bit of coding and the implementation of the coding. Will there be any type of bugs with the implementation? Um, it's already demonstrated through the testnet that they, are, they have some very serious bugs. So when they release their, their code, if, they, if you will, uh, what will that do to the network? Will, will it be safe? Will you be able to transmit your Bitcoin safely through this network, through a Bitcoin, through a non-Bitcoin core implementation, if you will? So user-activated soft hard fork. Oh, I'm sorry. User-activated soft fork. What's the downsides of the user-activated soft fork? So let's talk about this. I'm not going to read the entirety of Jimmy Song's um, breakdown because it already covers stuff that we already covered before, like what is uh, USF or the SegWit, things of that nature. Uh, what does BIP 148 do? Um, he kind of goes over that and explains it. I do want to talk about a, a few of his points within his article when he talks about, you know, Bitcoin. Uh, US, UASF and the skin the game, this concept of in order to change Bitcoin in itself, you have to pay a price. It pretty much sums it up. And this is one of the downsides of uh, both Segwit 2X and user activated software is that you have to put some monetary hope behind it in order to, to make any substantial change. So uh, Jimmy Song, he's a Bitcoin developer and entrepreneur. He's been very vocal on um, a lot of his posts about the Bitcoin block size today. We've read it in our discussions here um, about it, but also just um, within the cryptocurrency spaces, insights and thoughts have been something that have been passed around and, and uh, discussed and talked about via uh, his blog, you know, blog posts, news, uh, news reports, uh, podcasts, blogs, things of that nature. So this was published May 29th. Um, the title of the article uh, is Bitcoin User Activated Software and Skin in the Game. Uh, it's shared on Medium. So, the sections, here's section 1, section 7, or 8. How is it affecting network? Practically speaking, there will come a block exit, the first block after August 1st, 2017, not single said, but So, this is how the process, if you will, just kind of recapping it. They'll be rejected by a big 148 notes. So, you know, kind of a reminder, in order for uh, Segway to get activated, the push that users are doing is they're, they're putting BIP 148 um, software in the nodes, and if they a block is not signaling SegWit is going to be rejected, so it's not going to be added onto the chain. It's not going to be validated, if you will. But accepted by non BIP 148 nodes. For the sake of clarity, we'll call the blocks before X C, and BIP 148 nodes will be, will be on C, and other nodes on X. At some point, miners running BIP 148 will produce block Y, building on block C. So, other software, so it has a graph where you have C. You have X point, which is other software, and then Y, which is BIP 148 software. So there's going to be a split, if you will. And what we have is called a fork. So at the time being, this will be what's called a soft fork. Now, should there be no miners running BIP 148, the scenario will look like this. You, you have C, you can have that node running BIP 148. Well, as shown above, in the actual forks are by a miner. You still have passion power behind this in order for um, a switch or a change in the protocol. At least one miner needs to be running BIP148 software to fork. In fact, short of a switch to proof of stake or something similar, there really isn't a way for any sort of fork to be triggered by anyone but a miner. This is an important point because despite all the rhetoric, BIP148 still needs miners to have any chance of success. Essentially, BIP148 is creating a new consensus rule for its chain, simply signaling for SegWit. This means that for the BIP148 fork, provided that there's enough hashing power, SegWit will activate as 100% of their blocks will be signaling SegWit, which is about which is above the 95% needed. And what does this mean? If you're a user on the network, that means the transactions will be slower for two weeks at minimum, longer if the hashing power is slower, and more likely there will be some serious disruption as merchants and exchanges will likely suspend any Bitcoin transactions until there's some clarity on the forking situation. 
Further, even after the forking situation is resolved, there's a high likelihood of there being two big coins and a very messy divorce. So why is it called user activated? There are two ways in which Bitcoin 48 is user activated. First is that if enough users buy coins on the UASF chain, they can make even a minority fork succeed by giving it more economic value than the other chain. Indeed, that is the powers users have to buy and sell the currency. The hope is that by giving the, a the UASF chain more value, they can create incentives for miners to mine more on their chain and eventually overtake the other chain in length. At this point, without a permanent fork, the other chain would disappear in a really large rework. In this way, the proponents of Bitcoin 48 believes the users would show everyone who's boss and bring the miners to heal. The other argument is actually not users activated as much as economic nodes activated. And economic nodes are nodes that matter, like the nodes of, at various exchanges, wallets, miners, etc. The hope is that if enough economic nodes can be convinced to run Bitcoin 48 software, that more users will then utilize the chain, giving it more value and creating better monetary incentives for miners eventually overtaking the other chain in length. Once again, the end game here will be making the other chain disappear. So we do have a, a, a number of different wallets and merchants, particularly a few wallets and a few merchants that have already uh, reconfigured their software to accept Bit 148 Bitcoins. You even have some exchanges stating that they will do what's best for their users and recognize both coins. And then there are those that are saying they're suspended trading and transactions until these get resolved. So there is that when it comes to those economic nodes. There's some hesitancies, a little bit of a split, and some wait and sees, and some very non committal that haven't said anything. But what does supporting Bit 148 mean anyway? Uh, many users or Reddit seem to think that if enough users ran Bit 148 software, it, that it would make Bit 148 more likely, perhaps, but there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. contrary. First, running node software is very easy and cheap. In fact, it's so easy that you really shouldn't be trusting the node statistics as it's very easy to fake. No software is useful, useful because the node owners can validate the transactions of blocks for themselves. Essentially, no software is useful because you don't have to trust others, but it doesn't do much for actual blockchain state unless you mine. As a node, you have the right to reject blocks or transactions for any reason, but that too is not useful unless others agree with you. This is why Bitcoin 48 proponents desire support from economic nodes such as miners, exchanges, wallets, and merchants. And let's take a look at each and what their incentives might be. So we break down their, their incentives. Um, I'm going to go for a, kind of highlight some of them. I'm not going to go too deep because I just kind of want to get to the conclusion that kind of gives us the downsides, the downside of activating, you know, seeking to activate Bitcoin 48. From the perceptions of users owning and transacting the coin is the main concern. Supporting the 48 means being able to own and transact the coin that results from the fork. It doesn't preclude owning and transacting the other fork. In fact, most supporters of Bit 148 will want to have a non Bit 148 node running so they can sell it. Um, exchanges of Bit 148. From the perspective of exchange, the main thing they'll need to do is to allow deposits and withdrawals for people using their service. Supporting Bit 148 it means that the users can buy and sell the Bit 148 coin should it happen. Note that this does preclude supporting the other chain. In fact, it's very much in the interest of exchanges and even the UASF advocates for the exchange to support the other chain as, as many will want to trade one chain's coin for the other. This unfortunately has a lot of consequences. Exchanges the coin without sort of, some sort of replay protection. That is, transactions on one chain should not be valid on the other. Uh, this is what happened with the whole DAO situation with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic when there was the eventual split. There was a replay action. This cannot happen as Bitcoin currently stands without a permanent fork. By scaling exchange support likely means there's no chance for Bitcoins merging back to one chain. Uh, so you can't, you know, have this uh, happening where you have two chains going on for a while and then all of a sudden, whether it be Bitcoin 48 wins or the, uh, the other Bitcoin is non-segment uh, wins, you can't, like, all of a sudden that chain might drop out of it, one of them might drop out of existence. And therefore, you have this money all slushing and moving around and it's being withdrawn out of the system into users' hands and out of the exchange hands, really. So they, they can lose money, and that's what happened with the um, ETC and the uh, uh, Ethereum. There was a lot of money lost like, on the exchanges, on their end. Uh, that said, they may be a way around this by using futures, that is, not actually trade the coins themselves, but potentially split in the future. Uh, Infinix only does this with Bitcoin Unlimited 4. This has its own parallel server, as there may not be enough liquidity if Bitcoins will have to be locked up the exchange for the duration of the whole drama, much like Bitcoin, Bitcoin on limited coins or Bitfinex today. Because of this lockup, custodial risk features are not something we can expect that the vast majority of Bitcoin holders utilize. Kind of skip that. So wallets. Wallets in the Bitcoin space are most entirely open source. 
Support for Bitmark 48 simply means that the wallet is compatible with software. Should the wallet developers oppose Bitmark 48, a fork will likely be made supporting Bitmark values and merchants and payment processors and services. Supporting Bitmark 48 simply means allowing people to pay for good chain. It's not worth anything. It goes to even less since it's been quoting utility. Of course, merchants will have the same expectation range and that the points they receive will simply disappear. And so they'll want some chain reward protection and replay to protection before supporting both chains. So again, it's just all about protection and preventing, like, reorganization, going back to one chain, uh, replay protection where people have, you know, both points on both chains, um, things of that nature, so that they're already getting their full value for the goods that they sell. Uh, for all constituents that have examined this so far, supporting Bit 148 means that they can support both forks when the USF happens. There's only really, there are, only, there are really only economic benefits, not really economic penalties for supporting a Bit 148 fork. Other than some fixed costs, running a node, changing some, some software. The actors in the Bitcoin ecosystem do not have to choose which software they run. They can run both, and really they should if they want to maximize their value. Miners are the exception. When mining a block, they have to choose which fork to build on. In fact, they're the only ones in the entire ecosystem that are forced to choose. Anyone else can probably run both forks should a UASF happen. Miners have to choose one or the other fork when they mine a block. So if you mine the block that it, the chain that ends up losing, you can lose out on all that uh, Bitcoin, all that energy and time you put in for the effort. And that's the downsides here. And this is one of the hesitancies when it comes to these miners, um, when it comes to these proposals, whether it be soft work or hard work, they don't want to lose out. And scaling the game. Uh, scaling the game means that there's a cost of supporting something. Everyone else I've seen about essentially has only fixed costs, often fairly small. To support Bit 148. Miners have a significant continuing cost to support Bit 148. Miners, because of the forced choice of having to signal one way or the other in the blocks that they might have significant skin in the game. And this has significant consequences. You could expect the miners would be the last ones to show support for Bit 148 since they have to take the most risks. And there seems to be cases only one miner out of the top uh, 17 CD to support Bit 148. And that one, Bit 48, seems to be back in the agreement for consensus since 2017. And otherwise, more than 94% of the mining hash of power, and probably a lot more, are not supporting Bitcoin for you. So, we'll kind of skip it down here to this conclusion. So, uh, Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't care if you post arguments on Reddit. Bitcoin doesn't care if you put something clever in your Twitter name. Bitcoin doesn't care if you educate people, write articles, or make clever Twitter insults. Bitcoin doesn't care about your wishes, your feelings, or your arguments. With Bitcoin, you have to put real skin in the game, real time, like years spent refining software to remove vulnerabilities. Real money like millions of dollars to design, test, and manufacture ASICs. Real resources like developers, marketers, project managers, and venture capital. Making real things like no software wallets, money, equipment, and payment processors and exchanges. And whatever side you're on in this debate, debate, this is certain. If you want to change Bitcoin, you have to pay a price. So that is, you know, again, just like with the Segway 2X, um, there's a cost. And with user activated software, there is a cost to it. And the, the cost is, is are, are people willing to pay that cost? Are miners willing to pay the cost to mine the user activated Bit 148 uh, fork, if you will? Mine it, mine that chain, and risk it even the either the minority chain or getting reorged because it doesn't have enough of an economic follow. And there's economic cost to that. There's also, again, um, because of Reputation is key. Reputation is everything. Um, you may not want to be the one responsible for splitting a chain or failing to successfully split the chain and having strong economic power behind it. Um, people might not trust you with uh, their coins, if you're an exchange, if you're a wallet, if you're a merchant. Um, they might see you as someone that's not um, economically sound. Um, if you do successfully split the chain, what does that do overall for the cryptocurrency? that you support, that you're with, but the community in general, um, because you are going to have a lot of eyes both within the community and outside the community scrutinizing this new economic, economic situation, this new economic landscape. And so, th again, this is a, a, we spoke a couple of episodes back about Andre and Anconopoulos' uh, game of chicken analogy. Even if you have, from the steering wheel side, as user activated software people have done, are you going to push the gas to start the game? Are you going to push it? You know, are you going to go forward? Because it seems that both the Segway 2X individuals and the 
the seeking of the ejaculated software are very much a lock step into making their version or their solution, if you will, happen. So as of recording of this episode, there's one thousand or there's eleven hundred uh, no's signaling for bit one forty eight. We'll see that was a July thirteenth is when this information came out. So we'll see when uh, what will happen August first. Again there was some you know, information earlier this week about, you know, Bitcoin ABC and this BIP91 that's seeking to get locked in. It hasn't been locked in as of recording of this episode of uh, July 18th. But, but yeah. Um, yeah, so the downside, again, is just you have to, again, as Jimmy Song put it out for the user activated software, put a skin in the game. You have to convince some miner or enough of hashing power to begin um, the chain split to get um, segment going. And because really user activated software has been pressuring just everyone in general to get segment going, that's why we got segment 2x. Uh, I guess that's why we're getting this bit 91 thing going on. Uh, it's getting what it wants. Now, whether or not the other aspect of the community still wants to raise the block size limits and get what they want. That's definitely a hard fork, and we'll talk about that in Doomsday, what a hard fork could look like. Um, again, uh, it's all a matter of, I guess you could say, economic willpower. Are you going to put your money where your mouth is? And this is one of the downsides of this particular uh, proposal. Again, which is not coming from Bitcoin Core. Even though some Bitcoin Core people support it, um, and it using a bit from Bitcoin Core is not something that's actually coming from the Bitcoin development as a means of upgrading um, the protocol. They've already done that. They've already did it with Bit141 being in part of the protocol, um, in part of the recent Bitcoin Core uh, software. That's already there. They just couldn't get the miners to signal for it. So I think we pretty much covered the basis of the downsides of, you know, Sega 2X. The user activated software. Some of the weirdness of just SegWit in general, why some people are against it. A little bit why Bit 141 didn't happen. So that's it for this episode. And to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.